Okay, I'd like to call the order of the Committee of the Whole meeting on February 28th. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody to the traditional territory of the Squamish Nation. I'm going to move, uh, I'd like to move for the adoption of the agenda. Moved by Councillor Kenny, seconded by Councillor Fire. All in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried. Okay, and we're just waiting for Christine Matthews to join us. We're going to be looking at the 2017 to 2021 uh, doing a budget workshop. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just, uh, I'm wondering, if, did you change the was out of the room in terms of talking about the correspondence from the court? I was going to pull, uh, when we get into the correspondence, is pull the court correspondence and then we can have the court since they've come to speak to it. Okay, great, thank you. So it, attached in your package, you have uh, several pieces of correspondence in terms of further public feedback. The uh, communications had gone out and uh, put on the website, etc. This is the last sort of date that we would receive any further, and this represents all the different feedback we received. Today, we're here to just talk about a couple of um, key issues that have also been sort of rooted toward to the group in terms of. Uh, some of the other outstanding issues that Council would like really, really sent back through us. And uh, beyond that, really we're back to see if Council's comfortable with where we're at and whether we're ready to go to Ottawa or not. Um, there was some concern that maybe rates were still, or our, our overall financial plan model was still too high. And so we're um, essentially circling back to see if you'd like it reduced, then where would you like it reduced. So that's sort of the basic front of today. I know that we do have people in the audience for correspondence, so I don't know if that would be my one thing is if you wanted to tackle that correspondence first um, and ask any particular questions you might have. And then we can move back. But with the taxation piece, I believe Council understands you're setting a financial plan, and that's a level of overall tax revenue that you're going to require. And then when the revised role comes through, we'll go back and we'll revisit how will we disperse that revenue, <coughs> right? And, and at that point, I think Council probably has a few different questions around how do we tax business, how do we tax light industry, how do we tax the port? And I think that to take anything in isolation of that would be difficult because we, we need to see the impacts. So where I think it could be important to you today is if you, there's not a lot of room for that, if we're gonna meet your effective targets around effective tax rate increase. Obviously, if you wanted to give a bigger break than the ratios we established last year for one area, whether it's business, the light industry, or the port, industry, then obviously that could impact the effective tax rate that we need to apply overall to still come out with the overall revenue that we have. So that's really the interface between the taxation piece and deciding on the financial. So today, what we're looking for is whether or not you need, because of that factor, you need to go back in and rethink your financial plan to lower that, or whether you're comfortable with where you're at with the financial plan and you're comfortable taking that exercise to another meeting, maybe finance and audit committee, when we have the revised, or when we have the revised rule and can really truly know what it looks like. So those are kind of key factors today. Go ahead. Um, Thank you, Acting Mayor uh, Chappelle. There were a, a list of a couple of items that Council had indicated we wanted to talk about specifically today, and um, I have them here whenever you want to know. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's go to the correspondence since uh, Ms. Lowe has come from the court. It would be great to hear from her, and I'll just pull that correspondence. Is there any other court correspondence that Council is interested in pulling for discussion? Number five. Number five. <laughs> okay, do you want to come to the table and speak? Sure. And can I ask John to show John to the table? Oh, yeah. Where should we sit? I was going to say, I was going to pull the chair up. I think that looks better. Um, 
Thank you, Afternoon Mayor Chappelle and Council. I appreciate your time. Uh, we didn't prepare a presentation because our letter uh, was, we hoped, uh, outlined sort of where we, where we were at and what our ask was, was to have an opportunity to speak to you one more time before the budget is finalized in regards to our ask for the relief. Um, today I brought with me uh, John Shevchuk. Uh, John is uh, our legal counsel. Uh, but in addition to uh, having been with us for many, many years, way before my time even, John, <laughs> um, uh, part of John's practice is assessment. And uh, he used to be legal counsel for BC Assessment between 1988 and 2013. So John has a wealth of knowledge and really can answer any of the technical side of things uh, way better than I can. So uh, thanks for joining, uh, John. Um, really, we want an opportunity to see if you had any other questions further to not only the meeting you had uh, on January 23rd uh, and, uh, and also our, our letter that we sent on February 17th. So I uh, first open it up if there are any questions. If not, we'll open it up. Yeah, thanks. Uh, and I'm sorry you weren't here last time to talk about it. Mm -hmm. uh, but as far as like incremental increases to get up to this, can you explain that? Sure, how, to get how long that would take and how many years, you know, like, like right now, we're not giving you a tax break, so you're paying extra taxes. And if we did give a tax break on incremental increases, how long would it take to get to where we are today? Okay, let's, let's, yeah, let's clarify that a little bit. Uh, then we've got one. Sure. Um, the key thing is uh, that it's on a long term basis and council's going to be able to review it year by year if there's any, um, any break given at all this year. And in terms of incremental, um, it's not an incremental uh, basis that we're, we're looking at necessarily, although um, that, would, that would certainly, I can envision how that would work as well. The key thing is to remember that we're doing, um, we also have an initiative ongoing with the province. And the initiative with the province is to get us into a situation where uh, Squamish Terminals is operating on the same base as everyone else. There was, I watched the video of the last meeting and there was a reference to uh, the, the substance but not the name of the regulation that we're, we're looking at. It's uh, uh, the competitors of Squamish Terminals, particularly in the uh, Portland, benefit from a uh, regulation that exempts the birth corridor uh, uh, improvements. And it's that sort of uh, in, uh, benefit that is creating a, a disincentive for us. It's not just us though, it's other people who have uh, terminal facilities along the coast. And so what we're trying to do is get ourselves in a position where we get that benefit and then uh, uh, the impact that we would have from the full rate of taxation uh, will be in the lead rate. Councillor Race, you, you. No, I'm following that, I think. Doug, did you listen? Well, I mean, how can we help you get that? So there's, yeah, there's, so there's two things. One is the interim relief until we get to that place, because, and the job can speak a little bit to the process we've undertaken so far on the provincial side, but it, it's going to take a little bit of time. And um, because there are other uh, terminals or entities that are in the same position, um, there is an impetus of the province based on our conversations and the letters written to date to help facilitate this process and work through it with us. So it's not like we see this as a long drawn out process, it's just that it's going to take a little bit of time. Whether that's a year or two years, we can't say at this point. But we think you can help in that, that process once or hopefully uh, once uh, we get to a stage where um, we're asked to provide more information, then, then we can perhaps come back to council and say we need a letter of support or something like that. But in the interim, we're still stuck with a 68% tax increase if everyone were to stay as is because of the uh, loss of the, the dock and having to rebuild it. To give you a better sense of timing, my discussions with the, the provincial people who are been mandated to do uh, try to do something about this. They're looking for implementation in the 2018 rule. We're uh, trying to do the groundwork during 2017, have it in place in time under the assessment act so that it can become effective for the next year's rule. 
thank you. Um, my understanding is that um, 27.5 is the mill rate, um, the capped mill rate for a port. Um, and my understanding is that with new construction, such as the berth, um, there is in legislation existing uh, some kind of a phase in period. There's a lesser rate on at least a portion of the increase. 22.5%. In I've had interesting discussions with the Ministry of Finance on how that formula works. Uh, BC, I first went to BC Assessment and they said, uh, so what effect would this have on our new dock? And they said, uh, we haven't a clue whenever, and I say that in fairness, uh, when we are asked these questions, we hand it over to the Ministry of Finance. So I said, so who do you talk to? And so they gave me the name. So I phoned up the fellow. He, gave, he was very helpful. He gave me a spreadsheet that has this formula that it's just impossible to deconstruct. And, but the net result right now when they punched that out was uh, a reduction of about $22,000 in taxes. We're looking at about a $400,000 increase in that. So the, the, according to that calculation, the actual tax relief is pretty minuscule. And that's why we're here. If, if uh, that particular formula was of assistance, <coughs> uh, we wouldn't have to be imposing upon the district for some consideration. And it would be great if, <coughs> if your finance, your, your staff finance group could have that discussion with the Ministry of Finance and see if that's what's the number that, that's going to uh, crank out. I'm, uh, we can provide our correspondence uh, with the Ministry and the formula. And if somebody figures it out, maybe they can tell me how it works. But 20, about 22 grand was the effect. So, Councillor or Mr. Um I have had a chance to talk to um, Duncan Dillons from the Ministry. Um, he has indicated to us that it's roughly a 4.5 million dollar assessment will be eligible for the 22. And, and the reason that the full $9 million of the port is not available, as I understand it, is that the portion of the port was just it was a replacement. And they, that had been depreciated almost to the value of the when it was replaced. So they, so they provide the 22.5 on the improvements. So right. the additional things that the port did to improve the dock, that's my understanding of what they are basing the 22.5 on, which is why the full $9 million dock is not being um, privy to that 22. And it's not just the it's and the 22.5 percent is not applied against the full four million. What happens is some sort of um, calculation that goes year by year. And again, it's I've spent considerable amount of time with it. Maybe you, Chris, you have. And it, it somehow um, allocates for a various number of years, but comes up with a fairly small number at the end of the day. So within, I believe it's applied for a 10-year period on improvement. I can't speak to what's going to happen next year, but they have provided me with the assessment value I'd be using for that training, mm -hmm. and it's just under 4.8. So just a quick question and, and on they'll that. they'll confirm that in the meeting. Yeah, excellent. Thank you so much, Christine, for the correspondence. So the, uh, the DOP was completely depreciated beforehand, and I, then with the full, it no, wasn't completely No, depreciated. it wasn't completely depreciated, but the, uh, under the Class 4 regulations, mm -hmm. Uh, unless you're in a closure mode, the most uh, you can depreciate down to is 80% uh, depreciation, yeah. and it was at 80%. It was at 80%, and then they're char but they're not charging the 20% improvements. Uh, they're, sir? They're, they're charging on the full improvements from zero to rebuild the whole uh, dock, not just on the depreciation and the That's exactly it, because there, there is a new dock okay. in place. Thank you. I understand that a lot more now. Thanks. Uh, Jason? Okay, so yeah, my first question was going to be what, what the order of magnitude is, because the letter doesn't have any numbers in it, which I thought was odd. But uh, anyway, um, I also think it's odd that um, we would be going to the province to ask them to take measures to reduce our revenue. I, I don't really under I understand why you would do that. Can I address that for a moment? Yes. For, uh, when the 27.5% uh, tax cap was put in place, Along with that was a grant in lieu of taxes that was made available to you. And that's been indexed at a CPI each year since 2009. So the plan, what, um, what has happened in past circumstances, for example, with the port, is that when there was uh, uh, concessions given on the birth corridor improvements, 
uh, that effectively created a tax relief, uh, there was a consequential payment in lieu uh, to the districts that were affected for those. So it's not we're not asking you to support us in getting rid of revenue. What we're asking you to do is support us with the province so that we have a plan of the tax exemptions uh, coupled with the, uh, the compensation uh, that, the, that is applied in the first quarter of improvements. So, so perhaps I'm not understanding this clearly though. So the request as I understand it right now is we're looking at probably a shortfall of revenue in the order of $380,000 for this year, but in future years we're hoping that there'll be grants that will cover that. No, what I'm suge uh, suggesting and what the Squamish has su suggested is we're not asking you to reduce the taxes we've been paying. Um, we're actually asking you to maintain the level of taxes we've been paying. And that's Im important because, uh, the, as we say, we, it wasn't like we wanted to lose the dock. We went out and had a fire and had to deal with that and the, all the additional expenses that go with it uh, to build the new dock. So the um, the amount that we're actually asking that um, be set in taxes for the terminal is higher than you got from the squam from uh, Squamish terminals last year. No, I understand that. However, if yeah. we were not to take action, the amount that we would get would increase substantially. So what what I'm asking is, and I'm, I'm very clear about about the ask here, and you know, I'm, I'm not going to support it. I don't think this is a role of a municipality. Um, and I just, you know, we also have to keep in mind that we worked really hard to get to a budget that is still going to increase people's taxes by 5%. If we um, give up another 340000 in revenue, <coughs> then we're going to be looking, that's another tax point right there. Um, so it's just, it's very difficult. I, I mean, I understand the predicament, but, you know, private sector, you know, there's risks in private sector. That's why there's there's plans around that, and uh, I, don't, I don't support that. Well, thank you, Councillor. If I could just say a couple things. Um, one, uh, the number is, has been discussed in terms of what the number is and was presented, but in the November 8th um, uh, time when we presented the Council. So we talked about the number in general terms. Um, it is a 68% increase, which is in essence about uh, what's the number? Four. Yeah, four hundred thousand. Um, so I understand the difficult position you're in in terms of making the, the right decisions around budgeting and all that good stuff. Uh, having said that, we believe that because of the unfortunate situation with the dock, that it is something that we believe we could rally around or try and figure out at least something that would be palatable uh, to support a major employer who's been supporting the community for 45 years and wants to continue to do so. And this is a major impact on the terminal. No question about it. So as much as I am concerned about my own property tax and what I pay in this community as a, as a, as a resident, I'm also concerned about the 100 people I employ and how we can support this business going forward. And that's why we're here asking for your support. Karen? So <clears throat> I just want to clarify um, through the, the chair to Christine, so Councillor Blackman Wolf mentioned tax increase, but it's the, I'm not sure that we have a tax revenue shortfall with what the court is proposing. So they're proposing to pay the same as last year, which I think our budget would have been based on. No, so you've anticipated the increase. So our budget revenue need is based on the port paying the full 65% uh, increase. So let me, thank you. So in terms of the financial plan, we have a revenue requirement. That takes into account the amount that, sorry John, I don't know if you your last name. Mr. Shevchuk had indicated to me, um, sorry, had indicated that uh, we do receive and in lieu, so when that property court tax act came out, there is a compensation to the municipality and the province to give the courts this break, is what it was considered at the time. Because most people have them up at the industrial rates, and as you know, most municipalities do hit the industry fairly significantly. 
that in a whole other philosophical conversation for council, preferably on another day when we're really looking at taxes with revised revenue. But philosophically, the, the average across the province is right now at about 31, but it used to be considerably higher. And so when this Property Port Tax Act came out, they basically compensated us. So in the budget, we do assume that we're going to receive that $400,000 before as part of that whole revenue makeup to come to our general taxation that we still need to collect. We do take that into consideration. But the general taxation number of about 26 million, then we put that into a tax model and we say, how are we going to distribute that? And how does non-market change affect that, right? In terms of our assessment base having run. And under that modeling, based on a completed role, which is at risk, as you know from our last conversations I was in here, <laughs> Um, came out for the port paying approximately $221,000 more than last year. Okay? Because they had a non-market change. They, they actually improved their assessment position. Um, and there's lots of arguments around that's true for every business. That is true for every business. If you went and improved your business, you would receive higher assessment and you would probably be taxed more. That's how this system works. Um, so uh, hopefully that explains. When we're talking and banding around that effective tax rate of about 5%, what we're doing is we're saying how much do we have, with the cap in mind, with 27.5 and 22.5, because we have some preliminary numbers from the province. If I take those things into account, how much do I have to lift all of the other rates to still come out to the tax rate number I need? And that was just under 5%. If you change this so that we change those caps down, for the, the port, the 5% is going to go up. Has to, right? You have to make up the total tax revenue. So yes, it will impact your other taxpayers. Was it factored into the budget? Sort of, and because we're not just talking about the 7.7% .7 we were going to increase in terms of tax revenue, we're talking about what might that look like in terms of tax rate increases. So that's how all that relates. We have, I did have an opportunity to talk to Duncan Gillings at the ministry. He is their expert on port taxes, etc. I asked him about what is the, if we could support the port in birth portal, what would that look like for us? Is it, not, is it a slam dunk we'd get a fill? The answer was no. <laughs> there is no slam dunk that we would get a fill. Um, so even if we support the port in getting their birth corridor, your revenue could come down because if they get the birth corridor status and become exemption, I'm not sure there will be remedies from the province to do that, to fix that. I'm not sure if there will be remedies from the feds to do that yet. Um, and again, Duncan's opinion was he couldn't speak for the federal government, but he said they're not that forthcoming with bills anymore. So it is something to consider for council um, in terms of how, how do we support the court without compromising the revenue position for the So lots of things on the table to consider for sure. Okay, you're going to go to Ted and then Doug and then... Yeah, yeah, thanks. Well, I've heard $400,000 and I've heard $221,000. The two twenty one, the four hundred that I was referring to was an estimate based on... Uh, I don't have your internal workings. So the two the two twenty one is likely the, the, the closer figure that we're dealing with. And it's just the municipal, right? That's right. That's so right. they will be taxed on top of that for the other agencies, which we do not. And the 400000 would be uh, taken into account school tax, the uh, finance assessment, BC assessment, um, et cetera. So uh, it's not just the municipal amount that we're getting into. Well, I mean, for me, it's just the municipal amount. Today. Of course. That's of course. all I'm interested yeah. in. And, you know, that's why I was kind of talking about incremental. What kind of incremental increases can we have and how would that play out for us to eventually get this 221 and, you know, to well, I guess a little bit to Jason's point. I mean, I do think that Swimmers Terminals is a large employer, and they did have an accident. And, you know, I, I think we, we can should help a little bit. Um, now, with the dog, mm -hmm. I heard also someone say there was added things. Like, I know there's added things that wasn't on the dock before. Is this 221 based on those added things, or is it? across the board, because I know you got a dog for a tugboat now, and you got, you know, there's a bunch of other stuff that wasn't there on the old dog, so. Yeah, oh, and over time, we, those improvements have been added into our assessment, and we pay taxes on them. So in the tugboat, for example, that's, a, you're already uh, collecting taxes on the tugboat uh, station. Uh, well, well, that wasn't there before. Uh, it, it was there before the new dock. Oh, was it? Yes. 
Yeah, it's been there for um, since at least 2013, I believe. And we've added a couple of buildings. I mean, we're investing in the terminal. It's yeah. just that the dock is such a major investment. So anyway, I, I mean, 221,000 is one point, approximately, I guess. Say. It's approximately one percent. And so, I mean, I would like to hear some discussion on if anyone's interested on incrementally increasing it, because yes, if the province isn't going to give you any pets, I mean, then this will be the money you get. Right? And just to clarify, if I may, Councilor Chappelle, it's a one percent on our tax revenue requirement. All that pushes down into the tax model would have to be rerun and yeah. it could have a more drastic impact Clear. on that piece. Thank you. So we have, we, we have to model that um, and see what the impact of that would be. Thank you. Doug? Well, thanks. And that was <clears throat> one of my questions because there were two numbers out there. And, um, and so regardless of our decision, you're still faced with uh, the other $180,000, I take it, because that's the school and regional district, et cetera, et cetera. So, so we're talking about the 221. The question I had was, um, and I think we might have talked about it, but I just want to be clear on it. Generally speaking, municipalities are not able to support a private business uh, by legislation. Uh, and if we did this, we would certainly be supporting a private business. Is there some exception in ports? Um, there is. There's a letter that I um, sent in January that addressed it. And under the Port Property Tax Act, it's, it, it, uh, it sets a maximum amount, not a minimum amount. And it allows the municipality to set the tax rate for ports uh, within, uh, within that range of 0 to 27.5%. There's two sections, two parts of the section three. One is setting the 27.5%. The other one is specifically saying that the rate can be different for ports than other class four properties. Mm -hmm. So that's it. Uh, when we met with Chris in November, uh, that was her first concern. Uh, how is this not business, assess or business assistance? And so section 25, the deal with section 25 of the charter, uh, in my letter of January, I explained it. And the letter that we got back from uh, staff in uh, beginning of February, I believe, I said they agreed with uh, my opinion, but that there wasn't a, an appetite at that time to help the port. So so basically, because there's only one port property in our, in our assessment area, we can deal with that rate, I guess, at our discretion. If you had uh, two ports and two other class four, you could still do it under the legislation. Because individually. Individually. Mm -hmm. So okay. it's, it's under the Property Port Tax Act under Section 3, and it says specific, specifically under Section 3.3, 3, if a municipal tax rate that would otherwise apply to property subject to restrictions under subsection 1, which is <coughs> is greater than the rate permitted in that subsection of municipality may impose municipal tax rate on the property that is different from the municipal tax rate imposed on possible property. I was reading that before, honestly, to be around us being able to have different uh, class 4 rate than what the crop, what we were being forced to use for this, but uh, Mr. Schmidt, 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 Schmidt. <laughs> well. uh, an outline for me that uh, with that clause had Obviously, I've re-looked at it and went, mm, you know what, that does seem to override community charter legislation. And the, the portion of Section 25 of the community charter says no business ass uh, assistance unless an enactment provides otherwise. And the court does. The court tax Thank you. So I think this brings up a philosophical discussion that's bigger than <laughs> today. And, uh, but I do think it's worth a discussion with our tax rates and when we discuss our, uh, when we discuss the allotment of our, of our taxes. So thank you so much for coming. I appreciate you guys. Well, Did you, do, you have more, do you guys have more questions? Not a question. I was going to leave them with a comment. I understand okay. we're not making a decision today, yeah. but I just wanted to somehow respond to the presentation. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I have to admit, I'm having concerns with this. Um, I'll be frank with you. Um, Ports are already uh, capped, as, as Ms. Matthews said, below what the general population of industrial property pays in British Columbia. 27.5, I know, because that's the rate that wood fiber might become subject to, is, uh, is below the provincial average for um, rela in relation to residential. Uh, it's about 5.5 to 6 to 1 versus the provincial average is 7.5 to 1. So already it's, it's a bit of a favored rate compared to other class 4 properties. 
There is a small adjustment uh, by legislation, as we've talked about, um, around the discount for the new construction uh, relatively minor, but that's what the legislation <coughs> provides, and that's what's kind of imposed on us. And for us to go further than that, I think, is difficult for the municipal government. If you can persuade the province to be competitive with Metro Vancouver ports, I understand that, and I, I, I'm not sure if we can actually support it, but I would certainly understand that. Um, and the other difficulty, though, and you highlighted it partly in your letter, is, is we are, as a population in Squamish, facing significant, um, not increases generally over the whole rate class, over the whole population, but there are going to be spikes all over the place because of the way the residential assessments worked out last year. And there's correspondence in the agenda of one that's up around 68% and mm -hmm. the average is somewhere around 35 to 40. Mm -hmm. uh, that person's going to get nailed, <clears throat> just the way the assessment things work. And, and, and that person is not the only one I've heard of many. Uh, so for us, uh, you're going to get nailed, unfortunately, almost in the same fashion. Uh, for us to favor you over those people uh, where we really can't grant any relief uh, is politically very difficult, I think, for me, speaking for myself. Uh, and I'll come back. I'll let, yeah. let you, I just want one other point. We're also, you are at the moment our one class four property, um, and wood fire is kind of coming on screen now, and we're embarking on a, a negotiation on a tax agreement with them. Um, I have personal views on the way that should unfold, <coughs> and discounting taxes is not one of them, to be frank, and so I think this sends the wrong message to that negotiation as well. Um, so I'd be concerned about it uh, in that respect. But, um, so it's not a decision today. We may have other discussions on it, but I just want you to know how I'm feeling about it right now. A couple of comments, if I may. Um, the 27.5% uh, is a little bit lower than the average. As you pointed out, the average is, as Chris mentioned, 30 to 31 uh, per thousand. But one of our competitors is, resides in Surrey, and their class four right there is 19.5, uh, all in, not the general. And not just the municipal. So you can find examples through the province of where, uh, and particularly among your competitors, they've got a better tax structure than we've got. The second thing is, the 27.5% uh, is only taking into account the taxes that we pay and not the revenue you get from the government, which then raises the, uh, the ratio or the, the um, assessment to $54 uh, dollars per thousand instead of 27.5. So I think you have to look at uh, all of the revenue, not just the taxes that are coming from Squamish, because the government's chipping in 350000 a year adjusting for CPI to make up that difference uh, in the uh, class four rates. So uh, in the scheme of things, uh, it's not just 27.5% that you're getting uh, in taxes. And I've explained that in my letter. And I, I, I have difficulty, and I completely understand that, difficulty around what we are in the decision, but I also have difficulty um, uh, seeing how uh, providing an interim relief is setting a precedent, uh, where, however that's defined. I mean, I, we haven't gotten to that, but you know, we're, whether that's interim relief at X percent for X amount of time, I mean, we haven't even gotten to that part of the discussion yet. So right now it sounds like, I you know, from some uh, councillors I'm hearing an absolute no. Um, but others may be willing to look at at a win, you know, at, at some sort of striking a balance somewhere. And that's that's what we're open to having those conversation as well. I mean, I, I think that's what's important is that we uh, we try and deal with something that's a huge hit to the terminal, um, and that we are trying to to navigate through with the province and hopefully find a long term solution to to asking for support on the interim measure. Thank you. Do you want to respond to that? I was just going to give council a little bit again, based on the completed rule. We did just, I did on the weekend rerun the BC averages based on last year, the comments that are available on the statistics. So, as it would stand right now, if we stayed with the same ratios, it is true that the provincial ratio is sitting average, is sitting at 7.25. And right now, the port would be sitting at, about, with the library, would be sitting at about 8.15. So, a little bit over the BC average right now in terms of averages, and that includes port and non-port property, in terms of ratio to residential. Having said that, the burdens are wildly different, and most municipalities have a, main, a broader major industry pool than we have. So from a burden perspective, um, it, 
changes, and we have the burden for us uh, going to the port is 2%. The provincial average is 8.8% going to that major cost. So, um, you know, just to give you some, it's hard to compare in this palette and this palette because we all have different factors, different assessment breakdowns. Because the 8% is spread over a larger number of uh, class 4 operators, mm -hmm. whereas here about 2% is directed at one class group. Well, just to clarify, you said two things. Um, so, the number I was thinking of was 27.5, and these are a couple of years old, uh, was five and a half times the residential rate um, versus the BC average of somewhere around six and a half to seven times the residential rate for general heavy industrial. So, you said the port plus the library. Is the li how's the library involved in this? Well, because we combine our tax rate plus there's, we're still paying up the library debt as a component of the municipal rates, so we have to combine those two together. And so without it, like just on our general tax rate, it's 8.13 ratio. Without the library? Without the library, or 8.15 <coughs> the library. And the is going to become a moot point because this will be about the last year of debt payment on the library. So, so, so the industrial rate right now in Squamish is about eight times the residential rate, <coughs> which is above the BC average. Just over the BC average as of this year. As of this year. So again, I think council's going to want to look at its ratio scheme, mm -hmm. which you're going to want to look at it in relation to your light industry, your business, everything, right? So that you might want to revisit that for more than just support. Um, and we can certainly play with all those numbers, but until we have the revised role, we're guessing. <laughs> you know, we hope it's close, but as you know, we have right currently a fairly significant twenty million dollar error in our completed role, um, which we are trying to manually adjust in here to give us a rough idea that we're where we are closer. But until the revised rule comes out, it's hard to do this conversation with you in terms of how it really is going to shake down. And, yeah. based. and again, we're comparing our average this year to last year. <coughs> Did you still have a comment? Yeah, I just, well, I just, I, I, I wanted to ask the question about how much the province was giving us, and I heard that. Um, <clears throat> but to Councilor Race's point, we do have another class for industry coming, so that's something that I hadn't contemplated, so I'll definitely have to think about that. I'm still not opposed also to incremental increases to get you up to this. So, but I mean, what Doug said about our new port, we certainly don't want to set any kind of precedence where we're not getting our bang for our buck out of them. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Um, I've just been listening to the conversation and um, and thinking over the last few days after reading your letter, and I, I still can't come up with the win-win. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have worked so hard to address a lot of the infrastructure and strategic plan um, infrastructure needs but also our strategic plan in this budget and we've been cutting it back and cutting it back and I think council pretty satisfied with where it is and so I'm you know the the letter certainly provides arguments but I don't see a, the solution is not clear to me that this is a win-win for the community and for the port and I think that's what I'm struggling with still is how to make this a win-win um, because our small business owners you know are going to pay a lot more if we ha need a higher revenue ask and so I don't want to do that I, I've got people coming to me in the community on a regular basis saying my taxes went up by or my assessment went up by this much what's that mean for me how do I possibly uh, anticipate what that payment might be? Um, and, and you know, we've had to put up on our, our website information so that citizens can um, figure out how they might be paying their taxes that they know are going to be going up. So there's there is anxiety in the community about what this will mean for everybody. Um, and so, you know, for me, I'm sitting here. I just can't see a pathway yet. And maybe that's 
not to say that there isn't one, but it's not clear to me, and I'm, I'm not sure that council sees a big place in its budget where it would be willing to say, okay, let's you know, cut $200,000 here so that we can make room for, for the port. Um, we would have to cut some, some major I would, so I, I would appreciate it. I, no, I appreciate that for sure. And, and that is why we had the conversation back in October with the yeah. district. I mean, we wanted to have the conversation early before it was factored into the budget, <laughs> you know, because then then maybe there's some, a start to the conversation. And I mean, obviously, this is the philosophical aspect of it, but also the practicality of it uh, as, the, as the budget uh, gets, gets put together. Um, so, you know, uh, we don't. We would like to, we, we presented something that we thought was the cleanest way to approach this, I guess is what we're trying to say. Um, whether that is, you know, uh, an interim relief of all of it, or whether it's like Ted suggested, an incremental to get it to where it should be, um, just so we can figure it out on the, on the other angle that we're going at with the province. That's, you know, simply what we're trying to, to uh, work together with you on trying to figure out that solution. And that's, I think, the impetus of, of the first meeting we had back in November to say, let's put a let's put a committee together. And that didn't really, and that may not have been the right solution at the end of the day, but that's how we can understand. It's a little bit complex, and it's maybe how the best way to kind of having these conversations and having those that know the technical aspects, you know, more so than some of us uh, in the room, is how we get to a point where we have something that's uh, palatable for everybody. And the, the other part of it is. Uh the, uh, the port has to remain competitive to stay here. And in the letters that have been sent from uh, myself and from uh, Squamish Terminals, it's identified some of the uh, strains that the terminal is always operating under and has to work hard to keep uh, abreast of and ahead of. Uh, and when we get hit with the, uh, the increase in taxes, it doesn't do anything for our competitive position. I appreciate that. Okay, this is uh, this pretty much sets a really good course for the conversation when we get into the rate discussion. And I appreciate what Councillor Elliott said about find you know uh, that we maybe can't see a way forward, but maybe we can go away and think about this a little bit more when we come to that rate discussion because it is a difference in rate classes as well. And you know, I uh, a top of mind for me today is the tax caps that American companies get to come to BC to do films. They're at 16% capped. And that doesn't create employment for us, yet we have incentives within the district created in order to support that one industry. And I appreciate that the port has been around for a very long time and has created employment in this community for a very long time. And while we support film and, uh, you know, we have, we, we have a position created. We, we do a lot to support film in this, uh, in this region, but, you know, it doesn't create the employment that we need. So uh, I'm going to be taking that away, and I do think that it deserves some consideration. So I really appreciate you coming up today. Thank you so much. And uh, we will move on the agenda. Thank you very much for your time. Yes, thank you. Look at the screen. You can look at the chair. <laughs> <laughs> the chair she fell. Bear with me today. Got a little flat-footed here today. Uh, so the the key thing that we're back to revisit today is whether the financial plan <coughs> can go forward. So, and that's going to come down to a couple different things in council's mind. First off, as you know, we were we were looking at a set tax rate that was about 7.7 percent tax revenue increase at that point. We shook that down. It looks like it's under 5% in terms of effective tax increase. So 4.65 or so. Um, if you're having said that, absolutely we need to look at distribution and how, just because we're looking at the effective tax increases, how that impacts average homeowners versus something else, that's still out there. That's still questionable. Basically, all I'm saying is we're going to take all the tax rates and we're going to lift them about 5%. Where there's a cap, it's going to bump into the cap and we might have to lift everything else a little more to make that happen. But how it shakes down within each individual class back to that proverbial average household, right? 
will be a whole other number again. So we can look at that if council really needs to do that to get to the financial plan. We can certainly have a preliminary discussion or look at that today if you really feel like you can't you can't possibly move forward with the financial plan until you have those answers. Or you can decide that you're happy with your financial plan and we'll address how that distributes before we do the tax rates bylaw. So those are kind of the two burning questions in front of you. We also have a couple of key things that Council has asked us specifically to bring back for further discussion. Um, I have here that we have had some correspondence around the senior center gates. Um, and I'm wondering if, if do we really need it? Is it overfill, et cetera? So that's one of the questions that has come up. Uh, we also have some discussions around potentially adding to the budget for mileage for committee members for the ADP. And uh, there's been some discussions around populating the Adventure Center parking. If we are going to proceed with the lease, then we're looking at revenue and potential additional costs that council might want to do to that space. So there's a couple of questions that we were asked to bring specifically back to this table for further discussion today, not the least of it, which was the reason we are back here, or we're afforded another two weeks before we went through bylaw, was to really have a sober second thought and decide if there's anything else in the budget that we'd like to reduce to ensure that we are coming out or have done our due diligence to make sure this is the lowest financial plan um, that covers what this what the council is looking to do. Yeah, um, <clears throat> just uh, we also had, uh, I don't think you were in the room actually, we had a presentation this morning um, with respect to Wi-Fi in Brennan Park. Um, and that number, including operating costs, a uh, very rough calculation would be about $10,000. Um, so we might say yes or no to that. And the other is um, that one letter that I wanted to pull uh, with respect to some park playground equipment, mm -hmm. uh, where the ask in that was about uh, $15,000. Going my memory now, I think it was around $15,000 or something like that. I'm rounding that up. Mm -hmm. um, so just from my perspective, those are additions to the discussion. Uh, okay. um, the uh, senior center gates was correctly from wrong. Was that twenty thousand? We we do have some adjusted numbers and um, some pictures which would clarify what was presented at the town hall meeting, which wasn't quite what the project was by the seniors. Um, we have some pictures of what exactly the proposal is and what it is going to encompass. It's a little bit scaled back from what the seniors had presented and um, Mr. Hoskin does have some better refined numbers and better project. Okay. What staff believe and what the RCP believe is that somebody like me hid and waited till the facility was shut down and then broke into the offices. Um, I don't have exact, I don't think they got away with much taking hold of the final detail, but um, it's timely. <laughs> it's a, a timely discussion. Uh, thank you, Chair and uh, Committee. Uh, my name is Tim Hospital, Director of Recreation Services. Um, we did have a break-in uh, last night. Uh, of course, all the details aren't uh, aren't available yet. Uh, it was not a sophisticated paper. Um, <laughs> uh, looks like they probably hid within Brennan Park uh, and uh, came out once all staff uh, had moved on. They broke uh, the window on the arena side, uh, customer service area. Um, where uh, you pay to go for a uh, drop and skate. Mm -hmm. uh, then they went into the customer service area, they rifled through uh, desks, 
Uh, then they went into the booking area. Uh, then they went into the concession uh, and they drank juice boxes. Did they add that to the budget? <laughs> Uh, and then they tried to break into the AT home. So a, a very uh, cursory scan does not look like anything significant has been uh, stolen, uh, but it does highlight uh, the uh, concern to protect uh, computers, protect files, protect, uh, protect uh, uh, important information. Um, any questions on that before jumping in? Just a couple. Um, what is it, what's damage roughly you figure? Uh, they bro broke a window and they uh, damaged the ATM, which is not our uh, property. Uh, I don't know if it recalls uh, uh, being repaired. I would anticipate uh, the damage will be less than our deductible, uh, so it will need to be uh, eaten by our uh, maintenance or program staff. So we'll have those uh, have those discussions. Uh, we. Uh, uh, of course, we couldn't enter the customer service area this morning because it was now an active crime scene and uh, they had in forensics and uh, we were checking for fingerprints, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, I, I'm hoping we're open now. I uh, haven't checked in the last couple of hours, uh, but of course, people we didn't want to turn truck, people swimming or skating, so uh, they were given uh, uh, free access uh, today. Uh, the impacts to staff uh, were that uh, there was glass everywhere and their uh, items were uh, scattered about. Um, so uh, they've been working in other areas until it's been uh, cleaned up. Thank you. Follow up on it. Um, do we have motion sensors in there at all? When the place is shut? Was, the, was the place actually completely closed at that point? It, it, it was com yeah. completely closed. So uh, we, we, at uh, 3 p.m., uh, we, we checked in, our supervisor checked in this morning on, on security patrols. Uh, there was not any uh, vehicles in the parking lot or anything suspicious uh, that, that uh, they noted. They checked all the doors, all the doors were locked. Um, with, yeah, I, I don't know if you want to talk about the security at the park and open. Yeah, okay. Uh, I'm just curious if the motion sensors went off to detect that. We can talk, yeah, we can talk about that later. And, it's, and the security on all of our computer hardware and stuff in there is all that's all password protected on, on all that right. stuff, right? Yes. Yeah. And, and all our computers are locked in. Uh, yeah, well, not locked down. Yeah. They're, they're desktop yeah. They're desktop desk, similar to what is in the council chambers or in, in the hall. Um, still got them to take parts. Ken, did you have a question on this? Hey, yeah, I just I was going to say the guy got away with a bunch of chocolate bars. But what is our deductible? On the property? Yeah. Yeah. Well, just curious. <laughs> I, I know it's 25 for liability, but I have to check the property. So it wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't a break in. The guy hit it. Break in. So he, yeah, he did break into the customer's But service. he was inside the building. We think yeah. um, that that is the logical of all the doors yeah. were, all were checked in and, so. and such. I just, I just don't want to see a $50,000 request for financing for a system. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, moving on to the senior center. So this is timely. Um, the, uh, the budget request was for $25,000 uh, and uh, uh, where we uh, was, uh, our um, maintenance supervisors done some investigation and the actual cost to do customer service area in cafe is approximately fifteen thousand uh, dollars and this is for uh, this is for a system that would uh, be a roll down uh, shutter that uh, uh, would allow air through uh, would have a door in it or, or be able to open in the case of a fire uh, would be tied to the uh, fire system uh, so, so according to our European supervisor uh, it is uh, quite aesthetic uh, I haven't seen any pictures of it yet uh, the, uh, to only do the customer service area uh, is about $7,000, and that would be the uh, priority, uh, priority area. Uh, the rationale for this is our customer service area in offices at the senior center, uh, they must be staffed or made secure to protect our office equipment. So we have computers, uh, we have photocopier, of course we have uh, files um, um, back there. And uh, in my opinion, it's much more cost effective option to have a security state gate uh, uh, when you're open and don't want to have customer service staff in place uh, than to pay for customer service staff to uh, 
have to, have to do that. Uh, this request, this rationale is consistent with the District Hall, uh, the Recreation Center, Adventure Center, uh, Library, and just pretty much standing operating procedure. Uh, the the uh, front uh, reception desk, I'm sort of sure, I, I know all of you have seen it, uh, is very open. There is a little gate uh, on the back left hand side uh, to gain access, but uh, anyone can certainly just pop over the counter uh, as it is. Uh, as I mentioned, there would be an overhead storage unit, uh, it would be about a 12 inch uh, blockhead. Uh, there would be no requirement for 4 volts. Uh, which uh, would potentially be a tripping hazard. Uh, this would uh, tie into the uh, firing line uh, so it would open automatically, otherwise staff would have to be uh, close on site. Uh, front desk, uh, just some more pictures from uh, behind, uh, behind the desk. Uh, items of risk that you can see there are electronics, computers, photocopy of phones, uh, files, uh, and uh, information. Uh, so the two options, the one on the one, or the one, the option number one on the left is uh, what we have a price for, uh, and that's approximately uh, seven thousand dollars, maybe as low as five, um, but uh, I think we better keep something in the budget. Uh, and that would go from one wall to another. Uh, this would not go into the closet, which was a concern of the uh, seniors that they would lose uh, potentially closet space. Uh, option number two, um, I anticipate this would be more, we don't even know if it's doable yet, uh, but that would be a roll down type of shutter right on top of the customer service uh, desk. Uh, it would open up more space, um, but uh, certainly more costly, at least I think more costly, uh, and uh, we're not sure about the price yet, so I'm hesitant to say that's something we can do at this point. Uh, I've mentioned this already. Uh, for the cafe, uh, what uh, was proposed uh, it is a, uh, this is the, no, I, can I get up? Back there. Uh, so this is the kitchen area here. Uh, there is a roll down shutter uh, and a door we can make lockable here. Uh, it would require um, securing the, uh, the cash register here, of course, the uh, cash drawer was removed, uh, if not in operation already. Um, and here is a coffee, uh, coffee crafts, coffee maker. Here is uh, uh, plates, uh, utensils, that sort of thing. And uh, the food services provider has uh, some items for sale in a uh, fridge or a freezer right in this area. So what was proposed? Um, was to uh, put an additional screen here uh, just to close this area um, and uh, to, uh, to secure all of those, all of those items. Uh, I think uh, in consideration to uh, tax paper payer and uh, to make this as doable as possible um, that uh, we put this one on roll uh, and we will work uh, with the food service provider because those items are actually uh, his um, uh, to secure them every night uh, before uh, before he uh, uh, closes up. So there will be some cost to him of opening and closing. It will certainly take more time, uh, but I think that can be that can be managed. Uh, so with that, get another picture on the cafe. Give you a sense. We talked about that items at risk. This would be the option here, if we were to do it. We'd be crossing in front of that post. Uh, is a change in the budget recommendation that we drop the cost from 25K to $7,000 uh, and maintain that in the budget for security screen to protect the office and customer service area. And we will work with food services provider to secure their company and cash register. Um, as I mentioned, cash is already removed. Uh, and that second one was the one that the seniors are all up in arms about, right? Um, the seniors are, we, we, we haven't been able to land on what it is they uh, want at this point. Um, we have a meeting on uh, Thursday and we'll get into yeah. a greater discussion. Well, I think that's um, the one. Pardon me? That's the one, the one in front of the kitchen. Is the one I, the, the, 
the best of my understanding that, that I've heard from a, a couple of members uh, of his seniors uh, board uh, is there was concern that it would impact the closet, that there would not be enough closet air, uh, and that it would be aesthetically not uh, pleasing. Uh, my sense is, is that uh, they, they were concerned that it's going to be more institutionalized, they won't be allowed to go in the back, uh, that sort of thing. Um, I think these can be overcome. I think there's a big sense of change going on there, and that we've got to work on, uh, work with them and building trust. And uh, uh, at the end of the day, we'll in the center, um, and an adult oriented thing is a good thing. And this is something that needs to come with it. Otherwise, it's going to be cost prohibitive uh, to staff. Uh, this Thank you. They won't be able to get free Pepsis. <laughs> Um, yeah, so basically cutting to the chase, so we had a $25,000 place marker in the budget. Um, so if we take the 7000 out for the gate, as you proposed, leaves 18000 So jumping ahead to those other items that Doug brought up earlier, like uh, just to randomly throw them out there, the Willow Park, the Wi-Fi, the parking lot of the Adventure Center, uh, the, the concrete items to go in there, I think that was 8000 or between five and $8,000. Mm -hmm. um, so we should maybe be considering those items with the remainder of the eighteen left over how we could use that and apply it to some of those items. Yeah. GP's taking over for Doug and spending money. <laughs> Just cuts the chase, buddy. Um, the ADP, the ADP guys that drive up from Vancouver and down the Well, well we're talking about these things. I'm just trying to... Well, yeah, let's finish this conversation first. Okay. So, Sorry, I'm not, that's wrong does somebody want to move forward? <clears throat> So I'll move that the $25,000 be reduced to $7,000 budget for security screen to protect the office and customer service area. Thank you. Seconded by Peter Kent. Does anybody have any questions about that or concerns? Okay. I move to questions. All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Tim. Okay. On the other items. So you have uh, a post, where would you like to come back? Do you have Wi-Fi, Willow Park? Uh, Do we have a cost for the bullion for the efficiency of the parking lot? I'm sorry, I, I don't at the moment. But Linda? I have written down $12,000 from our last meeting that I would um, mm -hmm. want to get. Thank you. Let's see if, I may, yeah, if I may clarify, too, I believe that we haven't booked a uh, potential lease for the index. So I think those two could be that's around that amount, because I believe the lease was used to be about 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, any other committees that they sit on, they get the gas money. So we're not giving them gas money, and everywhere else they can they get gas money. So I just said $6,000. Is that what I mean? Over there. Now we're getting up to the taxes. <laughs> well, it's just something. Okay. Does anybody want to comment on that? Jason? And then Doug? Um, how many? What's the composition of the ADP right now? Because if I remember from when I was on it, it was mostly local people. Mostly people from out of town. Who happen to be developers in this community. <laughs> no, <Yeah. laughs> no, there are architects from Whistler, there are architects from Vancouver. I don't know. I, I would suggest that perhaps there might be some professional or other benefits that uh, are gained by participating on the ADP. Because people get credit, don't they, for Architectural Institute of BC? And, you know. it, is, it is not uncommon to, to uh, reimburse for travel. And we do have about four members who are committing at the end, which is a good thing because you don't want to get into a situation where you have all of your ADP members as locals because there's sometimes interest. Um, you know, a lot of architects are from outside of the community, and that's good because the local architects present their projects here at AAP, so there's a bit of a, um, a need to have outside professionals. And so other municipalities do reimburse, uh, and we are 
busy, so often we hold two meetings a month, which means more trips. Uh, and they've been the members have been really good at making sure that there's four. Um, we, we, so we were, if, if there was a number, I think five thousand would probably work to cover it off. Okay, amongst other costs, uh, Doug, do you want to speak to this? Yeah, and I I can support this. I think it's. Um, you know, these are volunteers, I think, and uh, we don't pay them anything, and they do us significant service. And all the things I go to, whether it's regional district or on behalf of municipality or something like that, I get 52 cents a kilometer, which I think is the standard rate. So um, it doesn't make any sense to me to, uh, to shortchange them. I think we should be grateful for the contribution. And I think this is a very small amount towards that. So. Do you want to put that forward, Jeff? I'll move $5,000 in the budget for mileage for ADP at the government rate. Seconded by Ted. So you want to speak to that? Um, as opposed to the government rate, um, there's a couple of municipalities that pay a flat rate. And we would like the ability within that $5,000 to see what is the best deal for Squamish and how, where people are coming from and what that actually plays out as. And then we would bring forward um, a policy or a bylaw amendment to include that in the uh, ADP bar. So, mm -hmm. so then I'll amend my motion uh, and delete the words at the government rate um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and just uh, at a rate to be recommended by staff as we come back. Thank you. Anybody else want to speak to that? Okay, I'm going to call. Is that a second? Yep, by Peter. Sorry, by Ted. Okay. <laughs> All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. So $5,000 to be added to the budget for the ADP. Thank you. Okay, do you want to deal with all of these things in, do you want to just go through each individual item? We have Wi-Fi for Brennan Park, Willow Park, um, 12K for the NDP mileage is done, seniors is done, 12K for the parking lot. Um, let's talk, can we talk about the Wi-Fi in Brennan Park? Why is it $10,000? Yeah, is that really for infrastructure, and you have the infrastructure as well as... Yeah, all the runners and the runners. And, and if I may, through the chair. Uh, the other thing would be the labor to install all that stuff, because yeah. there would be considerable labor wiring it all together, and testing and all that, and making things going around, and just making sure that it's sufficient. Is, can I just ask one more question on that? I know that we do that generally through the municipality. Would it be possible to get a provider to do it instead? Like, have installation? That's what we have now. Yeah. Well, it's uh, it's the general Shaw. It's not hiring. It's not what we have now. Is the Shaw router that goes up that you have to log into, and if we just got service from Shaw or service from Telus and made it a competitive bid, is that something that's possible? So it's often they will include installation for lunch. Karen, and then uh, my sense on this one is that Shaw's contract is up for renewal next year, mm -hmm. and I'd rather move this into next year's budget and just do a, a full evaluation of how we want to provide Wi-Fi mm -hmm. according to the digital strategy and not rush into anything at this point, um, and, and tie it in with contract renewals and yeah. figure out what the best deal is for us. And, and I recognize comments, comments of sort of keeping it in-house, easier for them. And, that's their preference, but I'd rather defer it to next year's budget. It's not, it's not a huge priority. Uh, if it was a little bit less and pretty easy to do, I'd say go for it, but I'm, I don't have an appetite for it at this point. Robin, Ted, and, and I, it's sort of moved now that, um, given Mr. Elliott's um, comments, but it was through the cable service provider that this would be, okay. and it, so it would be on our system, with our network, but we use um, various providers right now, yeah. and so we'll be increasing that. Ted, yeah, I'm with Karen, 100%. Yeah, um, I agree, uh, and I think um, because it's, there's a bigger picture for Wi-Fi in the district, it doesn't just include Grand Park, but it includes some hot spots downtown and a few other things that we've raised during the digital strategy, uh, trying to get a handle on opening up a corridor that's sort of active downtown where we could have everybody can have access to Wi-Fi. It's not just based off a of certain provider. So I think there's a broader picture to look at here. So uh, I, I agree. I think pushing it down the road a bit is probably a better idea. So I'll move, we refer discussions on Wi-Fi to the 2018 budget. Seconded by Councillor Kent. 
All in favor? Opposed? Mr. Kansas, perfect. Can I add just a clarification on that? Would you actually like us to put it uh, reflected in 2018 or just bring it back to discuss for 2018? Discuss. I guess we have to start with a discussion, and then maybe we'll have the discussion earlier before that, but it's not this year. Yeah, refer it, can we refer it to the Digital Strategy Committee? Or? Well, Shaw's coming back. Yeah, yeah, I'd like to refer it to the Digital Strategy it, Committee yeah. for discussion as a more comprehensive plan for Wi-Fi and Squamish. Do we need to move that? or? be part of my motion. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, another motion? <laughs> okay. Terry's keeping uh, Next. Let's uh, let's go to the parking lot. Um, I would like to see this play out before adding 12k to the budget, and see if it actually means if, if it, I, I wouldn't agree with spending 12k a couple years this year. <coughs> Karen, um, I actually think this would be money well spent because I think if we can avoid headaches, it's it's really not maximized that space and we know it'll be busy this summer even with the expansion of the smoke west park and if we can offset it with the revenue we'll achieve this year i think it actually makes sense to really organize that space so that people are parking efficiently the the aisles aren't wider than they need to be um and we have a revenue source to pay for it so I, i'd actually be interested in this one anybody else Ted? i'm with Karen. Hey, I would say that our revenue is being spent already. We've had to move $110,000 forward in our budget for the smoke bus this year to prematurely do the smoke bus. We took it out of other things, but we did bump the smoke bus from 2018 to 2017 instead of doing, which was uh, a significant hit in this year's budget. Um, as well, we have to build the crosswalks and we have to maintain the bathrooms, which should eat up the entire lease agreement. Um, anybody on that? Yeah, and I, um, parking in that space is never efficient. I mean, you can go there any day when there's parking and it's just, it's a bit of a free for all. So um, I think we have to take the step of getting this organized and, and it has not yet been booked in the budget. Lease revenue has not yet been booked in the budget. So. Uh, we bring it in, we pay out this 12, if it is 12, um, out of that, um, and, uh, and there'll be money left over for other things. So um, I, I think this is, this is money well spent this year. If I may, yeah, uh, through the chair. Um, I also think it's a good idea in that um, if we're going to have Crystal Turn come in there, we should, we should get a handle on this parking situation at the same time as we're looking at having them come in so that those two can work together in conjunction. Um, that's, you know, get, get their footprint established, get the parking established so that we can move forward lockstep and, and maintain some control over that lot. Is it, uh, Linda, do you want to speak please? Yeah, just to aid in the discussion, um, uh, $68,500 was reallocated from the Deathville Park, which was spread over 2017-2018 to go towards the small park parking lot to take advantage of free fill, which we estimate would have cost us 30 to 40 so just to help the discussion. Thank you. Yeah, the idea of taking money away from parks to make parks smaller to build parking lots I'm ethically opposed to. But um, I appreciate that people want to make the lot more efficient, but I think that this should be a tenant improvement and not, uh, since we've given them such a good rate, lease rate at $1,300 a month, I think that having the lot improved should be a tenant improvement because it is uh, the the project of a business, a private business, going into the lot that is requiring the efficiency be done. So um, I'll be opposing this. 12K is, is, could be spent in other places, I'm sure. Um, as well, the bathroom expenses, uh, you know, $1,300 doesn't even buy a one-bedroom apartment for a month in Squamish anymore. So I don't think it's adequate to be able to pay 12K and the rest of the smoke bus and the crosswalk. I'd rather see, I actually rather see the amount of expense that we have to pay this year to do the upgrades all in one thing and maybe have that in a different conversation. Um, seeing all the expenses in one place, like uh, the crosswalk expansion uh, and maybe have staff bring back 
the parking lot, ex the parking lot efficiency, the crosswalk expansion, the signs, and all the other requirements. Um, as well, I'm not sure we know whether we're going to need bathrooms yet, if they can use that crosswalk because of the industry, we have to look into industry movement because that road is uh, classed. We're not able to put a raised crosswalk in that area, I don't think. But I'd be interested to find out. So, Karen? I'd like to put forward a motion that we uh, put $12,000 towards uh, organizing the Adventure Center parking lot along, alongside uh, Crystal Term and that we use the revenue from the lease to offset that expense. Seconded by Councilor Kent. Any more discussion? I will say that, you know, without having a comprehensive look at what we're already spending, I would prefer to move this discussion to a regular council meeting. I guess this has to be moved to a regular council meeting anyways for discussion. Um, okay, yeah, so uh, I think if it's moving to a regular council meeting for discussion anyway, so I'd be happy to support it for discussion. But uh, when it comes forward, could staff bring all the expenses? Crosswalks, industrial route. Can we have a raised crosswalk in an industrial route? I don't think we can. Um, just all of the changes that have to go on that area and if we have to reroute the industrial traffic. So, sorry, I'm just wrong, maybe I'm missing. So beyond the goal year, do you want to talk about what other site improvements would have to happen? All the site improvements that will come out of the lease rate this year. Just aggravating it. No, I mean, I just want to know what are taxing people for for a private business. I think it will aggravate me, but I'm, you know, it's done now, so I may right. actually support it if it's a reasonable number. But I'm, I'm most interested in the in the raised crosswalk and what we have to do to get kids across the street, because that is a safety issue for the community. So uh, if we have to reroute the industrial traffic, we need to engage the industrial users in the area. Okay, all in favor? Opposed? Susan? Really? Yeah, I know, I have <laughs> more money in the budget. But I'm not, I'm not in, I'll actually probably not support it much more money going into the budget at this rate. So, um, I'll pay for my taxation. That's true. <coughs> and I still get another chance to change my mind. But okay, uh, $15,000 for <coughs> Willow Park. Is it? I can't $15,000. It's 14 and change. Um, change. Numbers in here. But, um, so 15000 we'll just find it. Fifteen thousand six hundred and twenty-seven, or fourteen thousand nine hundred. Um, I think, based on an earlier conversation, our direction was to um, have our staff over this year look at how we are funding parks and the rehabilitation of parks and designating um, not, but looking where high density is and where we need to do upgrades. So my feeling is is that Willow Park got a great upgrade, and. We need to be looking at further upgrades to um, playgrounds, not just Willow Park, but all of them to match their use um, with, in sort of a more organized way. I understand that they wanted Phase 2, but I'm not sure that I'm, I have appetite for Phase 2 at this point. Our focus is on creating a park in Denko, which doesn't have a park. Um, and I'm happy to circle back around uh, if it looks like the density and the demand is there for Willow Park in 2018. Um, but that's kind of my thought right now, is that we, we need to look across the whole district and not just focus all of our resources in the short term in one park. So I'd rather have that more complete view before I vote on this. Yeah, I'm with Karen. Yeah, I think that's No, I wasn't. I had put my hand up yet. What she said. Um, I don't know. I mean, we, we have room in the budget for it. Um, they have a very specific ask, and I mean, in terms of the wider planning, we know that didn't even start this year. So, you know, it's going to be another few years before anything gets done. Um, so, I think that this will help, and um, it is a good addition to to the park, and it is a high density area. So, um, yeah, I would support this. Yeah, and the reason I'd ask that this be pulled um, for discussion is uh, when it first came to us, um, 
going by memory, but it was thirty-five or fifty thousand dollars. I think was the was the ask at that time for something that was considerably more elaborate. And so this is obviously reduced. Um, and uh, as the writer pointed out, uh, she was encouraged to bring back something, and I was. I have to say, I was probably one of the people that said, you know, if you've got a phase two, let's see it, and we'll have a discussion about it. So, so, uh, so here we are. So my thought was uh, we could go ahead with this. I wasn't frankly thinking about um, other park activities that we would do uh, because I wasn't thinking that this would take away from anything else. I was thinking that I could support this on the understanding it did not come from taxation. Um, so once again, I was going to go to staff and ask them to <laughs> pick them up, pocket again. Like a piggy bank. Ask them, well, it's our piggy bank. <laughs> you smashed it already. Uh, ask them uh, if there are other alternatives for funding, and uh, and the one that, frankly, I was thinking about was surplus, and and it's uh, it's. I've had a couple of offline discussions with people. I'm not going to go into the whole thing right now. We'll have a discussion about the budget sometime in the future. And one of them, from my perspective, will be about surplus. But, uh, but wondering if there was monies from surplus that could fund this uh, if we chose to do that. Certainly not to support. we have 15000 in surplus? Yes. Okay. How much do we have in surplus? It's a secret. <laughs> <laughs> you know, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> but it's closely guarded. I have to work on a very tiny screen to find out. Okay. <laughs> um, but let me see if I can find sort of the last update of it. Um, we haven't finished this year, obviously, so I'll bet your office to how. Okay, I'll go to the that is right now, just if you provide me a moment. And you can yourself, so yeah, Ted. figure out roughly where we are. Do you want to speak? Uh, wait and see what surplus is. I mean, I... Okay. I mean, usually, and I apologize for this council, because usually we do talk to you about where our working capital numbers are, and how that affects the budget. So I'm not sure we did receive that this year. So, how much was the first phase? How much did the first phase cost us? 50000 No. I don't think it was that much. I can't remember. Gordon, fifty thousand. Yeah. Well, we did spend a lot of money. Yeah. It was nice because there was a lot of volunteers. And that. I would also. Uh, I I agree with Karen that it should be done in a more comprehensive. If we start picking pieces of equipment and paying for it by reserve, uh, I really appreciate this the community engagement that this group brought forward for Willett Park. It definitely is an amazing space right now. Um, but I think that without looking at the rest of the community and you know that $68,000 Ted and Camillo Dental, we're not going to put that in from surplus. So they get a smaller park this year. Um, I think we really have to do a better comprehensive park strategy and figure out uh, in general where we can fund the playground equipment from and how we can get each community uh, better parks and access. Is that unless we have millions in the surplus, and then I have to support it. Certainly, the surplus will be robust enough, regardless of which number, to handle fifteen thousand dollars. The last, the last update was significant. Did somebody want to? I just need to find out what has already been designated to other purposes, so I have to go into our system to do so that. Quite, so bear with me, because that's going to take. Maybe academic. So just so we have a chance to make yes. a decision one way or the other. I'll move that we have fifteen thousand dollars to budget funding from surplus for the recommended expansion to roll. Thank you, Doug. Second by Jason. Okay. Okay. If we have a robust surplus, I think that having one more piece of equipment just to support a community initiative that's come forward, I'm be willing to support it. Oh, Sorry, I know. <laughs> Okay, is there any more comments on this? And, and I just want to say that we also need to recognize that a lot of the legwork that has been done has saved the district money in terms of staff time or anything like that. And so that's why I just feel like this particular ask is, is a good value. And I look forward to the day when we have a more robust plan. Yeah, I, uh, I appreciate all the work the community has done. And, but I also know that there's, um, 
people in the community that also want to see some of our park space left as more natural playground areas. So not everything in a constructed built environment, but logs and rocks and trees. And, and Willow Park is a small park, and so I, I just want to not rush in to buy more equipment when what might be needed is some other stuff. So that's why I want to wait for a more comprehensive um, thought around this. And just for clarity, Dentville is a hundred thousand dollar budget, not sixty. It was more. It was a hundred thousand. Um, I think that robot, I, I think these equipment, this equipment was chosen by the neighborhood. So, and I agree with Councilor Black and Wolf that uh, it's going to save staff time because they've already done all the legwork, and that it's uh, and if. Staff feels like we have enough in surplus. I'm willing really to support this because of the amount of work the community did, and I will, uh, I will uh, call the question. All in favor? Opposed? Motion fails. Motion Doesn't the mayor yeah. count for the time? Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I like the idea of watching. So the motion oh. failed. So not the uh, surplus? Or at all? At all, nothing. Chair, um, actually what I'd like to do is, I, I'd like to suggest that um, we put this on the, uh, the next agenda uh, when we're discussing the remaining budget items, just recognizing that there is a member of council who's not present today. So just to have a full opportunity to consider mm -hmm. this particular item. And we do have a very robust surplus from them. Yeah, here, close to six million right now. Six, six million? million? Oh, careful. <laughs> <laughs> you said that, six million. <laughs> it's, it's all in, remember, all in relation. Ken Fund is the big one. But just, just on but that. Yes, we Jesus could look at there. repositioning. I mean, the what's the point of voting if someone's missing, if you just could bring them back when they show up? Keep trying. I mean, that doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. Um, to the chair, to staff, my understanding this is our last kick of the can, and the next thing that's coming back to us is the financial plan bylaw in the next um, regular business meeting. So this is it, and, and we are missing one person, but this is it. That's why we waited two weeks, because Councillor Black and Wolf wasn't here last time, and I actually asked staff to defer so that you had a chance to be here for the last discussion. And, and the mayor knew that when she put this on the agenda that she would be here, but this is, this is the last. Okay. <laughs> okay, so Willow Park, is there any other budget items that uh, anybody else would like to speak to? Anything that wants to be pulled from the budget? Well, there's nothing that, uh, yeah, I, I am concerned about the tax rate. That's all I have to say is that I, I have trouble discussing what I want to, if I'm comfortable with everything that's in the budget before discussing our multipliers. If our multipliers end up at, right now, uh, Christine was mentioning that the business multiplier is at 2.8, I'd be comfortable at 2.1 for our businesses mm -hmm. this year, which is a general, it's, that's the BC average. I don't want to be above the BC average. I spoke to the uh, Canadian Tax Association about this. If I, if I may, um, I would, if, if that is a concern for council, we can have a brief discussion around taxes right now in terms of which rate classes really impact that effective tax rate in which we are. That would be great. The port, for instance, if you were to bring it down, so prior prior to doing this, we were sitting at about a four point, sorry, I'm just trying to remember the magic little number there, but we were sitting at about 4.65. Um, Mr. Subcheck indicated that, you know, in Surrey they get 19, blah, blah, blah. So I ran 19 through the model. And it's doable. You go up to about 5.28 to make that work. Okay? So it's not it's not huge because there's only one way here. So you, you could potentially affect that. If I tweak the business one, even it's by huge. 0.1, right? so right now we're at 2.82, if I tweak it even to 
that gets exponentially bigger because you have so many minimum cost rates. So this will be a dance. I don't know that you could cut the budget enough to go to where you're talking about 2.1. And again, our provincial, based on 2016, the provincial average for business was 2.62. So just to put in context, so we are about 0.2 above, in terms of ratio, yeah, the provincial above average. provincial average right now. But just to give council some context around what we would need to look at more holistically when, when we got there, just to give you some order of magnitude in terms of how much you're willing to play with the rates or in how much that's going to impact your financial plan if you wanted to do that. Mm -hmm. um, Jason and Beth? Um, I'm pretty comfortable with the ratios as they stand right now. I don't think there's any large outliers. Um, and as I said before in the earlier part of the meeting, I, I don't support any changes vis-a-vis the board class. Um, and, you know, I think my, we might be in a better position to explore uh, some changes as to the business um, ones when um, the re revitalization tax exemption runs its course and we're getting our full revenue from our entire commercial tax base. So, you know, there might be some room to do some adjustments uh, in the future, but right now it's, I think it's everybody's being squeezed uh, in some way or another, and we all got to gotta shoulder the burden, uh, you know, in a fair way. <clears throat> yeah, thanks. Um, same comment. I'm also happy with the rates. Um, I was on council, it was my first year in council actually in 2009, our first budget uh, where we reduced the commercial rate to 2.7 at that time, which at that time was the BC average and that was our intent was to hit the BC average to make the town attractive for investment. Uh, I don't get the feedback, uh, I'm not directly in the business community anymore, I don't get the feedback from the business community indicating they think the rate is somehow outrageous. Um, it's more concerned about other business issues, um, zoning and all the other things that make a business work. So, so I'm not inclined to uh, reduce it. I will say, uh, and I'm not an expert on assessment and so forth, but the city of Vancouver, um, and I follow their politics just through the media channels, um, had a six times the residential rate for their commercial rate. Uh, and people were screaming. Uh, and so they started on a program of trying to rationalize the two, and they're down to four point something now, but they were bringing it down by 0.1 <coughs> a year, uh, just because a big jump from, you know, of, of 0.5 or 0.6 or 0.7 uh, would have just thrown the whole thing almost into chaos. So they've been taking it down in very, very small increments uh, to try and get to a point where they're happier. So, so going from 2.7 or 2.6 to 2.1 to me is uh, is almost a mind-boggling jump. That will have a huge impact on, on residential rates, uh, uh, and uh, and I think the impact on residential rates this year is going to be painful enough for some people. So I'm not in favor of adjusting it. <coughs> Light industrial also was brought down to at the same time that same budget year to uh, a number that, and I'm going by old numbers, is three and a half times the residential rate. Um, and once again, that was close, if not right on, the BC average, at least at that point. Uh, and so those two, from my perspective, those two have kind of tracked um, the BC average. Uh, and if we were going to change them at all, I'd want to really be relatively close to the BC average as opposed to taking a, a significant deviation from them. The heavy industry rate, and at the time we only had the one, and that was the port, uh, and it was capped by legislation. So I think I mentioned this before. We dropped our heavy industry rate to 27.5 from whatever it was in, in the wood fiber pulp mill days, uh, and I don't know. I can't remember. Um, but uh, really, it was just a matter of we have one, there's the other one, we we'll put them the same. And, and now we're faced with the possibility of the first other class four property coming on stream. So. And I, I just, if I may just end up only give you a couple of business rates. West Vancouver, for instance, business rate 4.36 last year. So we're, you know, again, you can't, I, I never like rates because rates really depend on their base and their, you know, because you know the mill rate, so it's not always a great indicator to look at rates versus ratios and things, but just as an, an idea, and they were a 2.1 ratio. So, you know, again, it's, it's, you can look at averages, but there will be distorters and outliers that 
but change that based on their council philosophies about what they're trying to do and what they're trying to promote. And that's, again, a philosophical discussion that I'd like to bring back for our tax discussions um, when, the, when we're going to do the tax rates by the council's comfortable with that. Yeah, um, I'm, well, I know I'm not going to be happy with the tax increases because I'm going to get a lot of flack from my wife. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, and she's the one that writes the check. Anyway, but I do think that, you know, like for next year, I thought, well, I'm going to start complaining early this year so that next year we can kind of keep it down. And I think what we have to do at the district is we have to get a handle on our spending. Trump said he's going to freeze government, blah, blah, blah. I thought, oh, that's not a bad idea. You know, and I'm kind of being sarcastic a bit there. But I do think, you know, like the OCP is going to be done. And we don't have all the resources going into SODC. And there's all these things that we've taken off the table. And I'm going to expect next year to see the district spend no more than this year to help try and keep the taxes reasonable next year for everybody. That'll be the song I'm singing for the next. Okay. Um, there is a letter that came through um, to the budget feedback website, and are we responding to those? Because it was a question about I'm worried about my tax bill. Um, can you give me some reassurance this won't happen? Some insight into the tax rate, which we can't do. But do we communicate back to people where they can get information, like that video that? We have from BC assessment about how it's spread out. So is someone making sure that it's happening? So uh, for my part, we are usually rerouted from communications. Those often rerouted us things that we will we respond to right away from an email perspective, and then I'll refer to uh, Ms. Arkwood in terms of letters and correspondence. Mm -hmm. And then, so we respond right when we get them. If they're just to council, we acknowledge receipt of them and advise them what's going to happen and then because sometimes there's an outcome uh, you know to the to the correspondence and then we follow up after the meeting what the disposition of their, their inquiry is. Thank you. Follow up? Yeah. Um, and this I'm just wondering um, if staff or council maybe I'm not quite sure um, so do we not deal with the port issue until we have the tax rate conversation or is there with all due respect, it's, it's up to council. It's just difficult for us to be very specific about that until we have a proper assessment based on role that we're dealing with in terms of definitively saying their rate will be X and that will be Y ratio. We're, we're working with completed role. Like I said, you, you have some latitude because we have one property owner in there. Sometimes you can tweak them a little bit without having as wide scale an impact as when you hit classes with more rate payers. Um, so there is some latitude, that's why I was trying to give you a bit of sensitivity around if you wanted to take both rates down to 19, period. But because, and only because Mr. Sedgwick threw that number up there as being what Surrey pays, right, in terms of the tax rate. But again, we're dealing with different assessment bases, different mill rates, different by numbers. So, you know, and again, we can look at ratios. I can go up and look at what Surrey's ratio is. It, it really has to be a built-in Squamish uh, philosophy. And, you know, do you want to look at major industry? If you do, then by all means, let's go back and have another philosophical conversation about whether our light industry and our major industry rates are at the right rates. Thank you. And I think that is a bigger discussion with the mayor here. And um, as well, you said the business tax rate is at 2.8. It's almost at 2.9? It's 2.82 in our model right now. Okay. Uh, yeah, 2.82 in our modeling right now. Conservation. And uh, and again, the BC average of all municipalities came out at 2.62 last year. I'm interested in what Doug said. That you said that we had capped it at 2.7. It's not point. capped. Don't use the word capped. Okay. We have set it. Set it at 2.7. Right. years ago. And it's been consistently at 2.7. We've gone up with. We had a financial policy that basically indicated we were trying to maintain the residential rates between 2.7 and 2.8. That was the range. Um, however, last year we had a discussion around stabilizing our ratios so that we could do some more of this definitive tax calculation discussion. 
Um, and so last year we, did, we landed on basically putting the utilities at 3.82, businesses at 2.82, the um, uh, class eight and class nines recreation and farm down at straight ratio relation to the um, homeowner or the residential. And then 2.8217 is, oh, sorry, that would have been farm and recreation and forest we had at 2.82, the same as business. And then, of course, the, the utility, uh, the utilities are fairly high capped by law at 40. And then we have the port, which is capped on rates. And that means the ratios change a little bit depending because they're capped at a rate. It affects how the ratio shakes down. Okay, thank you. Well, yeah, just, just to um, Councillor Elliott's point about do we have to wait um, and on this port question, if I understand it, we could, um, there being no other changes, we could go ahead with the bylaw on how much we're going to spend now because we haven't made any other suggestions apart from what we just discussed today. And the discussion around setting the rates, uh, which is part of the port, could happen at a later date and not upset our timetable. Um, thinking out loud, so I wasn't thinking about making that decision today, and there's now two people missing from council. Uh, but thinking out loud, you know, I, what Councillor Elliott said is uh, if there's going to be some scheme, whatever it might be, um, that we thought was somehow politically acceptable, how would it be a win win? And whatever scheme might be proposed, to speak for myself, I would not be in favor of funding it out of general taxation or transferring the impact of that <coughs> to the taxpayer. But now I'm thrilled to hear we have $6 million in surplus. <laughs> and, and is it realistic to think, and I'm really just thinking out loud, and I know this is an open meeting, but it's a budget thought, um, if they needed time to come up to speed, and I can understand even with a big business like that, when you get a significant hit, maybe you anticipated it, maybe you didn't, uh, all in one year versus staggering it in over two or three or four years, whatever it might be. And I know they're after the province to try and change the legislation, which might give them some relief, but it's not going to happen now, and, and we're facing an election, and there's some uncertainty around that now. So it's uncertain how long it might be before they have some, some definitive answer on that. Um, but if we entered into an arrangement with them to phase it in incrementally, as Council Pryor put it, over, say, three years, but we were looking for the win for the community and provide that over the next three years after that, they pay it back with interest. <coughs> um, are those types of things realistic? Is that, that, is that would be just difficult kind of, and not what I suggest to you, okay. uh, to be honest. Um, no, well, that's the answer I, I probably need then. Yeah, it, it, that one would be, I'd have to really take that away and think about it. And you really want to think about what that looks like in terms of the proverbial tax revenue increase next year. Because all essentially we would be doing is supporting whatever projects or expenses this year with a huge draw from our own provisions. And then next year we yank that back and it would look like our rates went right <laughs> So. I want you to think about that perception-wise as well. Not to mention that I'm not really in the business of loaning money to um, That's nice. private businesses. And in fact, the ministry has already told me point blank, you can't. So even though the port allows us to provide different tax rates, they have not provided me a scheme for loaning funds. So I think that there's a whole host of issues around that solution. I'm not a huge fan. On top of that, we are trying to stabilize. You know, part of our uh, long-range financial uh, solutions are looking at trying to get our capital injections to a certain level, trying to get our special project envelopes to a certain level, trying to get our, We've already dropped below most of those in terms of meeting the financial long-range targets. So although I understand what you're saying, it's short-term, um, it just seems like a wrong mechanism in terms of how we look at the budgets next year and things. So I would rather look at it from adjusting this tax rate thing and deciding that all the other rates are going to take a little more, absorb a little more. If you had a specific project and you want to do it by accumulated, you know, fair enough, but to just lump sum throw accumulated surplus, even to do that mechanism, I'd have to really get projects and think about what am I funding from accumulated surplus. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yes, 
so you would do that over like a three-year period? I'm and suggesting I would rather not do that. Well, you'd rather not do that. And uh, just thinking out loud, is the terminals planning an expansion? I am so sorry, I can't speak to the reports. I mean, I heard they were planning an expansion, and I know that would cost them a lot of DCCs and building permit fees and blah, blah, blah. Again, there is some flexibility to play with the rates. I think that probably in the big scheme of things, given that that is the effective tax rate, it goes within under 1% to do some of those things. Probably a better route to go. My concern is that you might want to look at business as well, and that's going to have a bigger skew. So if, if you really want to do that, we really need to look at compressing your budget. If you're not. Yeah, because dealing with rates, somehow, even if it's only small increments, it transfers the burden onto other taxpayers. And I think, I'll speak for myself again, that's the principle I'm not happy to go to. So. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, again, we can take a the surplus, we can fund more the capital, but we could decide to make take that surplus draw and fund our capital reserves. That would probably, I would suggest doing things like that more, because next year then maybe we don't do the 1% reserve contribution because we've made our targets for what we're doing annually, things like that. I think there's other ways to meet our financial future targets, but in terms of supporting the work, don't really think that's the best step. And it is a good question. Would you like us to look at the surplus to reserve? Because we are undervalued in our capital reserves for 10 funds and consider these things. Well, it's a bigger discussion than I wasn't intended to have here. I've spoken to Councillor Elliott about putting a discussion around reserves and budget debrief on a finance and audit committee meeting. Mm -hmm. so Which I think we have. That'll come up eventually. But again, if you'd like to do it with this budget year, that would be fine. No, no, I wasn't thinking about that. Except for that other scheme I proposed. <laughs> I, you know, I can certainly research it if council's really interested. I, I, I think there's a slippery slope there in terms of really how the perception and how it translates next year when you come to your budget. It's going to look like major increases. Yeah, no, and I take the point, and I accept your answer. Thank you. Is there anything else anybody wants to discuss? Is there any items in the budget that people want to pull out for discussion? And so everybody's going to be happy going forward with what's in the budget and to bring it into regular council meetings? Well, just to clarify, the part that's coming in is how much we're spending. We're still going to have a discussion to finalize, although we haven't suggested anything at the moment, at least not in the so, um, so we're still having a discussion to finalize the allocation. And that would happen when you get the, um, the final rule. So there are two bylaws that we pass as part of the whole annual financial plan and tax rate bylaws. So financial plan bylaws is what we're proposing. We basically put the financial plan bylaw and the budget on the street now, and we allow staff to proceed with those expenditure authorities. Then um, after, when the revised rule comes through, we have to set our tax rates, and that's where we look at ratios and distribution in terms of how we take that revenue from that financial plan and, and distribute it across the taxpayers, and so that would be something that we would revisit once the revised rule is here. And hopefully there's no major surprises beyond what we're trying to factor in now, but, you know, again, to, to, it's, it's difficult. It's why a lot of municipalities don't pass their financial plan until May. Unfortunately, that cuts out a good quarter of the season of you know, more than that, five months of workable season if you're not. <laughs> Thank you. Um, is there any more, I'm just asking this for the public, is there any more room for public engagement on the items that we've put forward uh, as changes? I think we just added a little, a little bits in there. And all of these things come, everything that we've added today comes to regular council meeting for discussion. And then we'll be uh, firm in what we have in our budget. Uh, and then it moves forward for adoption. Is that correct? After the rate discussion. So it's just a time. reminder, we bring you next the bylaw. Yeah. And we're going to bring you a council report and we'll talk about that. If we receive more political feedback before there, or you know, public feedback between then and now, we will certainly let you know that. And then you make a decision on three readings and then another meeting to make the final adoption. So there, there is a process here. It's, it's any other bylaw. So it's, it's not necessarily a closed case. We just package it up.
it up now and bring it for you for formal consideration. Thank you. I think the work that staff has done to get this budget here is absolutely commendable. I think you guys have done an amazing job this time. I really uh, thought our just and as well as council was really concise with their discussions and and, uh, and agreements and disagreements. So thank you all. Okay, is there anything else that we need to discuss? Okay, that is all we have on our agenda today. Further budget amendments discussion? Does everybody feel comfortable with everything? Okay, I will move to terminate. Seconded by Councilor Pryor. Your thought, that was pretty great.